and uh, with honors uh, student full scholarship at the St. Anna School of Advanced Studies. She's currently visiting research the ReLab at Carnegie Institution for Science, Department of Applied Biology on the Stanford University campus. There she's doing research in computational biology in plants. The objective is to explore machine learning approaches to unravel plant metabolic um, diversity. Now, in addition, science policy is one of Elena's additional passions beyond research. He's a board member of GeneSprout Initiative, an advocacy group for early career researchers on genome editing and agriculture, and she's also the founder of The Good Scientist, a network of young student early career researchers who provide pro bono support to civil society organizations and NGOs uh, with a science as service model. So I look forward to learning more about that. Please welcome Alina as our next speaker. Thank you so much, Vlad, for the very nice introduction. Um, I put up my presentation. So first of all, thanks to the Netherlands Merit Foundation. Um, so my presentation is about computers unlocking the power of plants. And when I was uh, picturing the way in which I could explain to you exactly what I mean by that, I thought about asking it first to an artificial intelligence software, what do you think this might look like? And uh, this is the output of DALI, which is an artificial intelligence uh, system that produces artistic pictures out of um, human language and like any phrase. Uh, so like, let me now drive you through what I mean by that. Um, okay, so plant natural products. So what I'm talking about is plant natural products. And what I mean is that nature is a remarkable chemistry, chemist. And not only that, but uh, also plants, like the plant kingdom is the most chemically diverse kingdom on, uh, among any living kingdom. And we are not only talking about products that are relevant for agriculture, or like food production, or like food additives or, or cosmetics, but also very important pharmacological products, such as morphine, which is the most famous painkiller in history, comes from the common poppy. Uh, artemisinin is an anti-malarian drug uh, that was um, for which the Nobel was awarded, uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded in 2015. Uh, that comes from the sweet wormwood, uh, which is another plant. Uh, and paclitaxel is an anti cancer drug that was approved by the FDA uh, for uh, ovarian cancer in 1992. Uh, and that comes from uh, the um, Western yew uh, tree, which is also fairly common in Northern, Northern America. But, uh, so these are just a few of the very important examples. And there are also uh, molecules that we consume every day, such as caffeine, that come from plants, of course. But there are actually more than a million estimated compounds that come from plants. And most of this potential com remains completely untapped. And the reason why is the fact that, the reason why the uh, chemical industry as of now has refrained from like digging, digging into this complex plant chemistry is the fact that finding uh, plants like available and like growing them for like actually taking these compounds is fairly difficult. Also extracting like purifying the compound out of plant material is, is not an easy task. And chemically synthesizing um, and like replicating with chemical synthesis complex compounds that come from plants uh, is also extremely difficult. And the reason, the reason uh, is that uh, plant metabolism is a complex network of reactions. Uh, but there is a way uh, through which by coupling uh, the complexity, the beautiful complexity of uh, plant metabolism with engineering principles, we can actually um, uh, produce a compound by taking advantage of the beautiful complexity of uh, plant metabolism through synthetic biology which almost look like, looks like uh, making drugs out of sunlight and thin air. Uh, an example here is uh, the introduction uh, of a pathway in a host plant such as Nicotiana bencamiana, which is a fairly common host, uh, and through that we are able to produce biologically a uh, chemical compound. So this sounds wonderful, and we have now uh, fairly some technical tools for doing that. So what's the limiting factor to harnessing this complexity? Well, it's knowledge about plant genomes. And the reason is that 99% of, like, of plants uh, do not have a sequenced genome. Uh, and of course, 
having a sequence genome is the starting point for knowing what the genome does. But also for like the very small share for which we know what every piece of genome does. Uh, we, uh, for which we know the sequence, we don't know what every gene in the genome does. For instance, here I represented, like in columns, you have the seven uh, organisms uh, in which like most scientific efforts overall have ever been uh, directed towards, such as human, mouse, and yeast. And even if we represent the genes that they have uh, with a pie, we see that only like the green part is what uh, is experimentally known and validated. Um, the gray part is like what is completely unknown. We don't know what that gene does. And the blue part is what we can predict, but we have not yet experimentally validated. So even for the species for which we have most scientific knowledge, most of the genome is completely, uh, remains completely a mystery. So the way that for plants I am approaching uh, in my project, uh, harnessing this metabolic diversity is by using special features uh, of uh, the genome uh, with like genome-led discovery strategies that take advantage of like features of the genome for doing that. A feature that we are exploiting for this purpose are uh, some genes that work together and are found next to each other in, you know, linearly uh, organized in the DNA. Um, and these are called the gene clusters. Uh, an example in plants, for instance, is um, momilactone in rice, which is a compound that is used by uh, plant roots to compete with each other, or like by seedlings to compete with other seedlings and inhibit the germination of other seedlings. And dimboa, which uh, is instead found in maize, and it's used, uh, it has anti-pathogen pro properties. So uh, the way that we are using the knowledge that some genes are like next to each other and working together is, um, and here like genes are the arrows, um, is that um, by like finding those genes that are located there in the genome, we know that they cooperate in a, in a certain pathway and produce a certain biosynthetic compound. And therefore this helps us drawing prediction about what uh, those genes are doing. So uh, the way that we are exploiting this knowledge in my lab is by de novo prediction and integrative omics. Uh, or uh, in other words, uh, we are automating like computational pipelines that are able to find these gene clusters in the genome. Uh, and the way that we are doing that is by integrating different like sources of omics data, such as from genomics, trans transcriptomics, and epigenomics. Uh, that run through the genome with like gene, genome mining pipelines and are able to define what are the likely boundaries of like these gene clusters uh, and uh, uh, by uh, also knowing what uh, like relating them with what the gene does we are able to define where a pathway is located within the plant genome. Uh, in particular, what I'm exploring uh, myself are the three-dimensional features of the plant genome. And what I mean by that is that the gene is not like the genome, so the DNA is not just a linear string of things, but it's actually three-dimensionally coiled within a plant cell nucleus. And this is relevant for us as we know that genes that work together and therefore likely form clusters are touching each other more often and therefore form like this um, like, um, piece of like three-dimensionally firmly coiled uh, DNA uh, it helps them work together. So I am leveraging this uh, information for like drawing prediction about gene clusters and eventually being able to uh, find uh, uh, biosynthetic compounds uh, from like knowledge about the genomes. So, um, okay, so actually when we were uh, planning this event and our presentations with Sabrina and Vlad, we were asked like, where uh, do, uh, do you see yourself? And uh, I wanted to answer this question by displaying some of like the startups that I know are using some of, um, well, these like scientific approaches to like plant natural product discovery, not only in plants, but also in microbes. And uh, I definitely think I can see myself, uh, well, uh, either um, working in one of them or developing my own uh, in the future, which would be lovely. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Claude mentioned, another area that I'm really interested in is like science policy. 
and I'm uh, now in this association which is called Jews Birth Initiative. Uh, we are working together with the European Commission to um, well inform uh, the policy about like genome editing uh, in agriculture for the future of European agriculture. And another area that I'm passionate about is the area of nonprofit impact. And I'd just like to show you a slide about that. Um, we're called the Good Scientists, and our motto, motto is Unlocking Science for Social Impact. <coughs> and uh, we are a group of uh, 10 people, and we uh, started asking ourselves, what should the role of science in society be? And we defined a goal with respect to this, which was to create equity in the access to science. And, the, and this does not only mean doing more scientific communication for us, but we wanted to develop a new concept in which we started from the needs of society and like reverse engineer what is needed uh, and like what, what, how science can help them. And we wanted to start from, we are starting from the needs of like nonprofits and citizen society organizations that target very uh, specific technical problems, um, impact, impact driven problems such as fighting climate change in a specific region, water purification or like uh, conserving a certain species um, by, or biodiversity. And the way that we are achieving this, um, we are designing these platforms, which are not, not launched yet, that aim to match uh, scientists <coughs> with the needs of nonprofits uh, through a marketplace. And not only that, but also providing a marketplace uh, as a source of centralized information about what uh, technologies developed in university could be available to uh, nonprofits through free licensing. So I'm joined in this journey by other uh, eight amazing uh, young scientists, uh, most of them out of Wageningen University. Uh, and I'm also performing some case study research at UC Berkeley uh, connected with this pro project. And uh, we uh, received a fellowship from the Clinton Foundation, which we were quite happy to get. So I'd like to really thank the Netherlands America Foundation and the people in my lab and the many people that are supporting my research and nonprofit. Thanks. Thank you.